few miles off the picturesque coasts of Massachusetts lie the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Like swans on a lake, they evoke a prominence that distinguishes them from their peers. You know, it's, it's wealthy, it's elite, it's not like any other place. But the opulence is seasonal. In the colder months, the tourists depart and the workers remain. The people who do know about it think it's only, only rich people live on the island. People who actually live on the island aren't that very wealthy usually, and they just tend to be the working class. Despite their similarities, residents rarely visit the other island. But I had a great sense of curiosity. I'm like, they kind of they have to be just like us. But once a year, they make an exception. Their high schools board a ferry to bring one island's football team over to face their gridiron foes on the other island. It's not the kind of place where you would think people would really care about football, uh, but obviously, you know, they do. and agony fly across the field. The two teams are locked in a rivalry that reaches back decades. Scores are settled at the game they call the Island Cup. There's thousands of people, fire trucks, banners, you just, you felt like you just saved the world from, you know, the aliens. And even as a 53-year-old man, the rivalry is still important to me. Things you don't see, the, the non-glamorous side of it all, all that culminates. They say enjoy it in the moment, but you can't enjoy it too much because you got to stay focused. Once you get your foot on the throat, you got to make sure you kill them. The rivalry seems inevitable today, but it wasn't always so. Nantucket's football team, the Whalers, received its first career coach in 1964. Over his 45-year career, head coach Vito Capizzo turned the program from an experiment into a powerhouse. When my father first heard about Nantucket, he had no idea where it was. The only thing he heard of was Nantasket, anything close to Nantucket. And that was a, uh, a town on the South Shore that had an amusement park. God bless you and thank you, and thank God I ended up in Nantasket, otherwise I would have had I would have had a merry-go-round name after me instead of the stadium. We have to take a boat over to Nantucket, and he got to the island, and he went out to check out the uh, football field. There was a barren wasteland. There was more dogs than fans. Uh, in 1964, that was a moment when uh, the football program um, really took off, and the, the, the island had found its career coach. He was a natural leader, and I think that's what really separates him from other people. He was either his way or the highway and um, always wanted the, the best for us. He'd never let you get to the promised land. It was always a little better. He could always do a little more. Yeah, and he, he wouldn't accept anything else. In the early years of football on the island, um, there, it was tough to field a full enough team to uh, have practice, to have scrimmage games during practice. So what the uh, coaching staff eventually did was reached out to the Navy unit that was based on the island and asked if the young adult men in their 20s would be willing to scrimmage against a high school football team. The Navy base was active because President uh, Kennedy was using Hyannis as his summer home. So the Naval base had a, a place for Kennedy to fly out of Hyannis Point and get over here to Nantucket if there was a security leak of some sort. I remember going to a couple of them out at the Navy base when I was very, very little. But it got to the point where the, they were grown men, you know, beating up on the, the little guys. Some of the cadets were so big and so fearsome that um, the students, uh, the high school students, were petrified to play them to the point where I had one former quarterback tell me about how he stepped up to the line of scrimmage to take a snap from his center and realized that the poor kid's uh, seat of his pants were wet from having wet himself because he was so terrified of facing off against the, uh, the team's, no the, the cadet's nose guard. And my father said that's enough of that. He didn't like that anymore. He didn't think it was a fair deal. Martha's Vineyard's football team took longer to find consistent success. In the 1950s, the Vineyarders took their first step forward by plastering over the rivalries among the island's various high schools by uniting against a common enemy. 
Nantucket. Well, the towns were separate, and the, neither the high schools, they had basketball teams, but they didn't have football teams. So organized football in 1953 was the first time. It was the first time those guys put on helmets, shoulder pads, cleats, and, and the outfit to play organized football against other schools. In 1960, they went a step further by officially combining all the Vineyard High Schools into one. For coaches, say, to bring people together that had fought. They used to fight together basketball teams in each town. But yeah, Nantucket became our arch rivals. Nantucket, on the other hand, originally focused on a different rival. Vito's nemesis was coach Steve Gavea of Provincetown. When I was a little kid, we went and played Provincetown, and my father never liked that coach. Nantucket and P-Town were very similar in the 1960s when I got here. They were very blue-collarish and, and tough. So while Nantucket looked at Provincetown, we looked at Nantucket. Everybody would meet in the gym and the Provincetown coaches would assign uh, rooms to the uh, uh, homes to the kids. When Provincetown came to Nantucket, the same thing happened. Fido had a, a way of putting the better players into homes that would have distractions, maybe uh, girl, uh, daughters that were cheerleaders and things like that there, so that maybe uh, the good players would be up late at night and not ready to play the game the next morning. Stirrings of a rivalry between the Whalers and the Vineyarders occurred in 1966 when a fight broke out between the Vineyard players and Nantucket Naval Cadets. Back then, the visiting team would stay at the homes of their opponents. After that year, hotel stays replaced the host family system. This stymied the establishment of inter-island friendships that used to form because of the host system. You know, whatever that fight took place, and for whatever reason it took place, the uh, legacy of animosity took, took on right from that point. It wasn't, and, it, and, they, and, and from that moment on, it was a dislike between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, between the new teams. The old teams were like us, we were still friends, but the new breed, no longer. In 1976, Nantucket was forced to find a new rival. There was a disputed call on the field that Provincetown felt did not go their way, so in protest against the ref's decision, uh, Govea pulled his team off the field. I was just standing there saying, what is going on? Vito was what was going on. The officials, what is going on? And we just all stood there. And finally, we talked to the officials. And the officials just stood in the middle of the field saying, well, let the clock run out so that you guys get the victory. And the game ended. But uh, Nantucket had to get out of town quickly because the rocks and bottles were being thrown at the bus as we were pulling away. My father said that was such a low class move to him and such a slight and disrespect. He was Italian, he never forget anything and he never forgave either. So Vito was definitely uh, looking ahead to a time when his team in his mind would need a new rival. We decided that maybe Vineyard might be a good rival, one island against the other island. But at the time, I don't think there was any way he could have realized that that rivalry would have grown into the thing that it did grow into, which was, in the end, much more substantial than his um, heated rivalry with his arch nemesis, Steve Govea at Provincetown. Two years later, the Island Cup was purchased. The rivalry was now official, although still one-sided. Martha's Vineyard would not consistently match Nantucket's skill until 1988. That year, Donald Herman became the Vineyard's first career coach. This was the final spark that lit the fuse. The rivalry exploded. Coach Herman's team did what Vito did back in the 70s and the 60s. Donald came along in, in the 90s and the 2000s and dominated the Island Cup. Fortunately, with a lot of help with assistant coaches and players, we were able to turn that around and um, made that game much more competitive and much more meaningful to both communities. My father used to say, uh, that guy stole my playbook. <laughs> he took all his ideas, you know? But he was a, he's a, he was a good coach. Coach Herman was a great coach. Oh, the snake. Boy, did he, he really, he did not like that guy at all, my dad. And, um, but they had a respect for each other, you know? And in the end, there's a nice picture of those two guys at the Vineyard game when they, last time they saw each other and they're arm in arm. And it was, uh, it was a special relationship that they had. The mainland took notice. The tradition received national recognition on NBC, in the New Yorker, USA Today, Sports Illustrated, 
and even in The Simpsons. Bart's football team played an opponent dressed in the same color jerseys as the Vineyarders, thanks to Simpsons writer and former whaler Donna Carey. Don Herman brought that level of competition to the vineyard and Vito appreciated him very much for that fact and they both understood how much the rivalry meant to one another and also to their respective islands. Vito retired in 2008. In his final years, he found it difficult to match his previous level of success. Part of the reason that uh, Vito had a hard time in the 2000s was that he left his teaching job. He stayed on as coach. I think he may have lost connection with some of the kids and um, I've always felt that it's very important for the head football coach to be in the building. I mean, he had pneumonia and gout and he's hobbling across the field. They had, this is late in 2008. They didn't win one game all season. Cheer for Coach Capizzo! Let's go! When he walked onto the field, he tips his hat. I call it his Babe Ruth moment. Uh, I think at that moment, there's 500 people in the stands cheering him on. You can hear the, we love you, Vito. Thank you. They all friggin' came out for him, and uh, that really was, uh, was an amazing time for him. His shoes were hard to fill, and the Whalers tried out several coaches. One of Vito's former players, Joe Perry, rose to the challenge in 2018. Get caught, not be at school on time. You can't dress, you can't play. Today, no one needs to explain the rivalry to freshmen on either island. Islanders are born into it. The journey repeats every year in the late summer when players start preparing for the next Island Cup. On the islands, hot, humid August days are best spent at the beach. But football follows a strict schedule. What happens in August and September pays dividends later in the season. So there's no time to waste. By October, coaches know their stars in areas that need improvement. Last week was last week. What is good as your last game? Let's see how good we are. No! Mercy! Whoa. Let's get it, Ben Just as importantly, they know the same about the team on the other island. You've, watched, you've probably watched a lot of film of Coach Herman. Yes. What do you think his playing style is? Does he have certain tendencies? Um, I'm not allowed to uh, say that on camera right now. But Normally you try to game plan to take what they do best away. He'll, he'll grind out the clock. He'll just want to move the chains. Then we've got to try to stop the scheme and stop those. Try to force him to do something they're not as, co as comfortable with. 35 and 36 though should be big plays for us. Those are four, five, six, seven yard gains every time. Taylor G. But that's what I anticipate them doing. If I were if I were coaching Nantucket against us, I would just hammer the ball. I would just run, run the ball down for The gears of the big game begin to turn. The two teams' athletic directors coordinate the transportation. Now I think we're getting in this smaller freight boat with toll. For 10 gram. It still charges 10 gram. Still charges? Yes. I thought we were getting a break on. Nope. It still charges 10 gram. Got in the bill the other day. Until Which 2008, the team made the journey on small airplanes. Yeah, so we used to fly the little nine pseudo planes. Scary, I guess would be the, the best term. Um, I'm sitting in, in the co-pilot seat. As we are approaching our landing on Nantucket, all of a sudden the plane was almost takes like a 90 degree turn to the right. And just before we, I thought we were gonna crash, he turned the nose of the plane down and had a perfect landing. Um, I then, as best I could, asked the co-pilot what the heck that was all about. And he told me that's a, that's a type of landing they use in high winds called crabbing. And my response was, do you think you could have told me about that ahead of time? <laughs> and I remember just thinking, this was the longest 12 or 15 minutes of my life. What goes up must come down in the Island Cup Words have a way of coming back to bite their speaker. Welcome to Martha's Vineyard Regional High School football action this week. Since Coach Herman took over, the Vineyarders take discretion seriously. During the season before the Island Cup, all team members are banned from even saying the word Nantucket. And uh, as we all know, they, no one's allowed to use the N-word or W-word all last week. Saying the word Nantucket would be meaning you weren't focused on the task at hand, which was the team that we would be playing on Friday. 
the exception being the private coaches' meetings about Island Cup strategy. Is that still running? Yeah. Just for a second. Sure, I'll turn it off. I believe that Nantucket and the Vineyard is a rivalry because they're so similar and because we're two islands off the coast and we live similar lives. We all have to take a ferry to all of our away games. Away games are all day affairs. Bring your focus into the game. Bring your spirit, bring your warrior spirit into this game. Hit these guys. They don't know anything about Nantucket. They never played us before. Uh, the... but it is true. Darian, they don't know. They have no idea. They don't know. Welcome to the league. You're going to gonna get this every Darian's single Darian's year. Darian's I feel like most Cape schools see us as like a rich, like spoiled little rich kid type people. But most of them, they don't know that like we're not living in two hundred million dollar mansions and riding around in Lamborghinis and everything. They just, that's what they just assume because of all these pictures and how expensive it is here and social media and all that. 60, 70. Oh, you we gotta, we gotta play that every week, including practice. Until that final whistle blows, we're going 110%. While off island, Islanders cram in as many mainland conveniences as possible. So the team buses stop at the mall before going to the ferry docks. Some people like to stay in the food court and just get a lot of food because you only have that certain amount of time to go around the malls before you wait for the boat. Nantucket definitely more separated from the world than we are. I mean, it's much easier for us to get on. Was it much easier for us to get on a boat and get out of here? But still, the same thing. Like, it's different. When I got to college and I was roommates with a kid who was in this town, and they would go hang out with the kids from the other town and the other town and the other town. They would see him around. We were on an island. I mean, we'd finish our game, we'd go out, whatever, we were on the island. Yeah. No malls, no fast food, there's no like social gatherings. There's a huge substance abuse issues on Martha's Vineyard. I don't know if Nantucket has the same issues. Nowadays, you see a lot of these kids, generations now are inside on Xbox, PlayStation, PC. Being a kid on our team um, has its own special challenges. She done has called men to be men. And there's something in the heart of a man you can't domesticate out of him. There's something in the heart of a man that causes him to want to protect those that he loves. I taught my boys to be gentle and to be good, to be kind. See, we still need young men dreaming dreams and old men having visions. Be leaders in our homes and our communities. Let me tell you, there is a battle raging. One that isn't in any, uh, any one particular place. It's the greatest battle of all time. It's the battle for the souls of men. Play sport, you, there wasn't either get in trouble or play sports really was the, the options. When I was 18 or 15 or 16 or 17, you're in the moment, you know what I mean? And so it's the Island Cup and you're preparing for the Island Cup. You know, I'm sure it's big in Nantucket. You know, the whalers stand for a lot of tradition. People love it when they, when they kick Martha's Vineyard's ass. If a kid feels that pressure, if he feels that he's carrying the, the weight of the world on his shoulders, that can be very difficult because he's going to feel a level of, of extreme disappointment uh, if he doesn't perform the way people want him to. And I've, I've seen kids that just shoulders begin to sag and they take the responsibility not only for losing, but for letting the entire town down. And that, that, that's a big responsibility, and I think that can be too much responsibility. You know, they're kids. You know, Donald had curfew. Donald had accountability. They had progress reports and stuff like that. I think one of his biggest accomplishments outside of the game itself was just being able to give young men a sense of pride. He had a thing called Vineyard Pride, Purple Pride. You know, he's able to help build people confidence within themselves, pride within themselves, stuff that's really not too familiar as teenagers and stuff. And Football is the one sport where 11 people have to come together from different socioeconomic, different religions, different races, different, a whole lot of different things. And they have to say, for this one play, we're gonna pull everything together. Football is the hardest sport in the world because it's the most comparable to life. We, we messed up really on one play. Yeah. That was a great goal line stand that almost we almost finished off. It was one play. Okay. Come on, focus up. So, but way to respond. Good team game. Good team game.
Yeah! yeah. All right, now, on a count of three, we're going to use the N-word. One, no. two, three. Nails up, yeah! About 20 miles east, there is another ferry leaving the mainland. We gotta stop number one on the vineyard next week. Dude, their fullback is a chew. That's huge. Mean, Dude, but he, he he's slow. does not he's get yards. Yeah, no, Bro, it sucks. He's, tea, he's that's a chew. The Whalers just finished a season game, but already they're discussing the vineyard. The only Island Cup victory players on this team experienced was in 2016. Getting off of that boat when there's like Dude, when the when the door rises and then you see you're not even everybody the and you're still in the lights. Dude, we went up the stadium. We people standing on top of their cars. Dude, I yeah. was so overwhelmed. I was like, was I, don't know, I didn't know what to do. Coach Ryder, Coach Ryder was like, "You ready for this?" And I was like, he said that to me. And I was like, ready? "What are you talking?" About? Yeah, I had no idea. Wait till you see, like, there's gonna be a bunch of people outside. And and it was not just, just a bunch of people. The lights, I was like, whoa! Oh and then you got that legendary picture of Holgate holding up the cup. Yeah. Like, oh my god. The week before the Island Cup is called Game Week. A Hollywood script about the next seven days might swap pep rallies for classes and parties for homework, but this isn't Hollywood. The traditions of Game Week don't replace school stresses, they're added on top. Watching a player slip up when you know they can finish with good grades, it's, it's frustrating because you feel like the rest of the team is out there putting in work and you're just slacking. It's it, it hurts sometimes. We would do these these Spanish videos. I gotta do that video tonight, and it's probably not gonna be good. We'd have to write the whole script, and I don't know. I, I, those were like my kryptonite videos. I would hate to do them. On Martha's Vineyard, academics come first. Student athlete, and we have had several players on our team that have missed either games or been unable to finish the season due to poor academics. There was never a day when a coach would ever give anyone any crap for, hey coach, I'm gonna be late, I need to study, or I'm, I'm not doing too well in this class, I gotta go talk to the teacher. I think Coach Perry is more understanding. Yeah. We just have team talks in the locker room, like this person needs to step up. If you know you're, if you need to stay after school, just come to practice with a pass. Yeah, I got my quiz stuff for the test today. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna doing flex. Okay, Can you jump step outside? Hi, Mom. Hi. Mom. Juggling school and football is definitely a skill. We have school from 7.50 to 2.20, practice from 3.15 till school work. five or six, and then having to go home. Nothing else matters. Playing football, if you, if we don't have you on the field. Get home when you're so tired. You're so, the last thing you want to do. Is thing you want to do Sleep is definitely a sacrifice during football season. I mean, what I do yeah, is do you fail. I, I, fall, I fall asleep. All I time. take a nap. <laughs> I take like a two-hour nap and then wake up. Two-hour nap? <laughs> yeah. What? Right. <Two> right. <laughs> Mental mistakes, right? Offense, defense. Mental mistakes. We try to have our team reduce or eliminate them so we can be successful. What's the four, How do you play what's the four technique? Huh? What's the four technique? Technique? Four technique. <laughs> What's the four technique? Four hands down. Four hands down. What's the four technique? I think... <laughs> oh, oh, Brian, yeah. oh, oh, I think he knows yeah, himself, just not the term. Four, you know? He asked the exact same thing. Literally, early. early. Not the term. All right, 3.30 on the game field. <laughs> <laughs> Staying out of your own head is hard enough, especially when your opponent wants in. So we would run a certain game a certain way so that when we have to give them vineyard that film, it's it's not even anything that, it's not even our normal offense. We would play differently in a whole game just to try to throw the vineyard off as much as we could. And over the years, I think it's a terrific rivalry, especially in the years when Vito Capizzo is coaching over Nantucket and he and Donald had this thing going back and forth, <clears throat> sending each other weird things through the mail, the rats, the cupcakes, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. You know, MVY was the radio station over there, so we would call, the night before the game, we'd call up and say, play Tangled Up in Blue by Bob Dylan, or uh, we will rock you. There was, uh, there was a little bit of social media back and forth. Little Twitter finger action, but they were—they definitely—they started the—they started the low shots, and then I think some of the 
kids on our team uh, gave it back to him. I got a feeling. Oh yeah. It's out of sight. Oh yeah. I got a feeling. Oh yeah. Stop in your pride. Oh yeah. Will and Spur, I'm sending you. I'm gambling. We're gambling this week, and we're gonna gamble to win, brothers. We're bringing it. WFO on three. One, two, three. WFO. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure you're gonna have to cut this, but wide the f open. Start the week and right away it's just a different feeling. Practice isn't an hour and a half, practice is two, three, three and a half hours. We're outside if it's raining, we're outside if it's freezing. The Huna man talking, okay? Keep hitting until nobody answers. The Huna whaler, okay? Stand up, we're gonna yell that out. Two, three, go! Kahuna. That's the first thing that you think. I don't even know what that means. Kahuna <laughs> Matata. <laughs> The, the November is known on the island for being windy, brutally cold, and just not very nice to the human body. When you got inside, your face would just sting from the heat itself, and you couldn't even wash your hands. Like, I'd have to let myself warm up before even going into a shower afterwards. We'd have night practices under the lights right at the end of the season, so you're, you're kind of in a spotlight almost, which I loved. I, I always loved practicing under the lights. There's no slowing down during Vineyard Week, and it's easy because the players are just as much into it as the coaches want us to be, because it's the Vineyard game. Oh, that, that is so good. Like the game plans of the two teams, game week looks different on both islands. All week we have a bonfire, powder puff game, a special like team dinner. Everything, pep rallies, you can't, it's hard to go anywhere without someone asking, are you ready for the game? This week is gonna have to be an exception. We, we, we have clearance. to swear. We yeah. Well, no, no. I mean, like during the walkaway drill, Brian. No, what's the walkaway drill? So many push the walkaway drill would be people yelling and cursing. You're gonna be made fun of. You're gonna be laughed at. You're gonna be called everything in a damn book. He'll pick certain people that he wants you to tease or haze. People that maybe have had temper issues. I'm talking about from their fans and even the adults that are over there. Okay. A lot of them have no class. <laughs> what? Oh, what? The ball, the ball Owen! Have it under control, calm down. <laughs> Look at the ball! I did it! Because he knows that what's gonna happen on that game is gonna be 10 times worse than what takes place on that Monday or that Tuesday. You say that your flow real ill, but I guarantee that I'm a little bit sick. I wanna get up in the booth, I let it loose. Like I just can't get a hold of my liquor. Every time I'm in Joe Berg, they be calling me Lecker. I play my position, but they think I'm a position, cause they know I'm strong. I'm gonna take up. Way too many hits, come and get some. Got so many flows, so I'm pick one. Did the DJ play this? As if the teams didn't have enough to contend with, there is one threat that can't be defeated, only avoided. I would say the big, the big three things are sprain strains, dislocate or dislocations, fractures or concussions. Bruises, aches, and it's leading up into people getting like really bad injuries. So I feel like, but I feel like the vineyard game nobody will really care anymore because it's the vineyard game. Whole intensity just changes. So I am actually dreading going out to this Nantucket football game. I'm worried about our kids. So this sport is, we can't get in a bit of a stigma about it. I really had to like struggle to get my parents to let me play football. I had a kid that I put on the field for one play. I said, I need so-and-so to block number 32. He blocked number 32 and he was concussed. And so we had to walk off the boat as assistant coaches and tell the parents they had to take the son to the hospital because he had been concussed in the game. So the. The human skull is a, is a closed space. It's basically a jar. And inside that space is the living tissue of the brain and associated nerve endings. But that was scary because like, he never came back to play football again. Devante already had the hamstring issue. And then next thing he knew, he was just getting back on the field, I believe. And then it was just bang. So an impact on this side, for example, where a collision in, a, in hockey or football would be here, that will drive 
the contents of the calvarium or the, of the skull to cause the uh, brain actually to translate back and forth. Very concussed. I remember seeing him on the field just like completely out of it. Devante couldn't even, I'm pretty sure he could barely talk, couldn't answer basic questions. And that results in at least uh, a contusion um, to the soft tissues at the microscopic level uh, or, or a more macroscopic injury where there's actually, you can have actual bruising. I got it in the first or second quarter and I knew like I had a concussion. I pretty much couldn't leave the house for two weeks. The light really was, my eyes were so sensitive to the light <clears throat> and that going back to school for the first time after two weeks, I had to leave school early because just the fluorescent lights killed me. But the helmets nowadays compared to when we played are so much safer. They're close to 300 bucks, a helmet. Wow. And uh, so the helmets we wear, the exact same helmets you see you know, college players, NFL players wear. So I think if we can show that there's enough being done because the rules have changed, helmets are not going to eliminate concussions. Throw that out there. Once the season actually started, the coaches would have drills just for tackling and it was a totally different technique than I used to do. The, the techniques of tackling are evolving. Don't lower your head, always eyes up, keep your head back. It's much safer. I don't know if I want, want him to play beyond high school, I think. That's um, where I can stay Yeah, I, I wouldn't want him to play beyond high school. I'm glad he's played. I think it's made him the person, it's helped to make him the person that he is. I don't want my kids hobbling around when they're older or head concussed, but I've seen plenty of kids go through football and be okay. I think I would let my son or daughter play in football, rugby, or hockey, but I would do it in a way where if, as I, being um, the parent, would be an active part of that uh, process. I'm so really proud to be a football player. Basically all those brothers that, of yours that have played in this Island Cup, that have won the Island Cup, lost, gotten injured, concussions, any number of things, that's definitely in the back of your mind. The threat of injuries may inspire mitigation instead of trepidation on the teams, but there is one thing that strikes fear in their hearts, and that's letting their communities down. I'm sorry, but I got... This is such a huge game. So it's just so much to lose. You didn't want to disappoint your family, your friends, your community. This Everybody's expecting a win. You have like literally the entire community behind you. And that's what's amazing about it. Everybody comes together. And there isn't really anything like it, honestly. College football is nothing like it. But we can't hide. If we mess up, it's obvious we mess up. But that's a big part of the Nantucket Vineyard game, is having your fire trucks. And the cannon. Don't forget the cannon. When um, the home team scores, the um, fire engines and the, and the police cars, they, you know, they put their lights on and, and, and blare the horns, and it's just, it means so much to the community. Well, you know, I, I think the more isolated the community is, the, the more you're looking to rally around something, to, to believe in something. That's why I did Friday Night Lights. I just got that sense driving across the country and going to dozens of small towns. The high school football stadium is a shrine. It's a temple. They're beautifully maintained. I remember in Texas there would be a town-wide drought, but they were still watering the football stadium. And, you know, we all want to put our hopes and dreams somewhere, and there's something, in a sense, romantic and powerful about putting that responsibility on the, on the backs of kids. You know, they're still innocent enough. They, they still sort of personify what football is about, teamwork, discipline, playing through pain, and that really appeals to us. We all have to believe um, in something, and in many of these communities, it is the rallying point that brings together people from all different stripes. One of the few places, actually. When we dress up kind of jokingly, switch jerseys with like the cheerleaders, and they give us like one of their like the skirts. That's always, as a kid, not exactly looking forward to it, but you're like. Because you see some of the most like like masculine dudes, like the biggest dudes you're always looking up to, and then they have to wear those skirts, and you're like, oh my god, <laughs> it's hilarious. I remember mine was like way too tight. That was one of the experiences I remember, doing the little dances that they do. No, it's, it's all, it's, that, that's a fun one. Powder Puff, though, was actually amazing. 
After the pep rally, the players try out another role. They become coaches for the football teams made entirely of cheerleaders. The junior girls take on the seniors at the Powder Puff game. It was a good experience for me. I saw the saw the game saw the field from the coach's point of view. We're going to defer. We're going to defer. We're not doing kickoff. Right. Right? I know. Hey, no, we're we're get, we get the ball. We didn't teach you anything. We didn't. We didn't. We got. Hey. Wait, wait. We got five girls that can catch over your thirty that can't do shit. Perhaps the Vineyard girls were better prepared. So remember, it's three steps. I did three steps. Boom. Ready? Wait, oh shoot. Wrong one. Wrong one. Man, tuck it. I'm just saying. You guys better be ready. Everybody be ready. Because we're coming on. And we're coming strong. Oh, yeah. Let's go, man. Oh, we're going to kill them. We're going to kill them. They're dying. They're dead. At the end, junior coaches were caught off guard by the senior girls. Oh, shit! Over on the vineyard, the Edgartown Fire Department sends out a couple trucks to the high school. There will be a bonfire and a funeral of sorts. You know, if anything, it's that's respectful. Low. You know, in like certain cultures, that's that'd be the proper way to get that's rid of. We're gonna bury it. We're gonna burn it. We're gonna burn it. Who in the whalers? <laughs> Coach Herman. Yes. Coach Perry. Hey, Joe. How you doing? Great. And you? I'm doing well, thank you. What a beautiful day, huh? <laughs> Gorgeous day. Hopefully. Going to stay tomorrow. I didn't realize you were doing f uh, the, ma the field maintenance over there. Yeah, I do all the field uh, I, I, 13 years here. So you're the one, I guess you're the one I can thank for not having the uh, sideline soaking wet last year when we came over. Yeah. That was, Beetle used to soak that area for you, huh? Keep, keep well, you know, you know what we were going to do? We were going to scoop up all the goose poop on the field and uh, just spread it out on the visitor's sideline and wet it down <laughs> Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, the, the field. There's actually uh, less goose poop this year. They, they got some dogs to run the fields. Oh, and, they, yeah. uh, but, but I'll tell you what, up until maybe two or three weeks ago, you couldn't take three steps without stepping in something. Yeah. Uh, it's disgusting over there. So what's your plans for tomorrow? You guys, what time do you think we're you're going to get here? We're out of here. We're on the boat. We're headed out at 7. Yep. And we're going for a one thirty start as opposed to the 1 o'clock. 1.30 start, I heard. Okay. Weather-wise, it's going to be one of the best events we've had in ever, probably. Good. So that's good. Well, hopefully we don't hear any sirens in the background over there. Uh, I hope you hear a lot, actually. I hope that they well, have a lot. I hope, to, I hope you guys have PTSD <laughs> from the cannon to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah, right. Well, Coach, it's good talking to you. Same here. Best of luck on you, Monday. You too. Uh, yeah, really. All right, Joe. <laughs> I'll talk to you tomorrow. Talk to you. All right, bye, bye bye. Best of luck on Monday, not, not on a Saturday. <laughs> Know your assignments, do your assignments. Today's the last day to tune it up. See you can destroy on three. One, two, three. See you destroy! Ready, go. Some years, the Island Cup has been the last game of the season. When that is the case on the Vineyard, the customary senior lineup takes place on the night before the Island Cup, right before the team dinner. Very few events put high school into perspective than one of the last acts of the seniors' football careers and the rest of the team and the coaches, what they do is they line up and they walk down and you tell them, you know, either you love them or what they meant to you or what they meant to the program. And you being in tears and seeing kids in tears, realizing that you came in as a 14-year-old boy and hopefully you're going out as a 17 or 18-year-old man. The dinner that we would have before the, the game would be a way for us getting together and to also a team bonding to show for, for the seniors themselves, it was the last team dinner they would be having. I've never had such good food to this day. The best, best, the best steaks. Team moms present an altered version of the poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. This is your last game. We couldn't be prouder. Let's go to Nantucket and make whale chowder. On Nantucket, a different feast unites the team. Named for the late Joe Vieira, a Whaler team captain who played during the late 60s, this event celebrates legacy, mostly. Oh, 
how old is Donald Herman? 60? Probably. That'd be a real asshole, wouldn't it? 60s No. You are part, because you go to this school, because you live in this town, you are part of this family, <coughs> this community called Nantucket. You didn't ask for it. You didn't ask for it, but you're here. You're in this room tonight because your parents have will pride. They made decisions to try to give you a better life by living in a place like this. And it's hard here, man. Will of pride equates with where we live. This is Joe Viera in 2008, had complications from an operation and he died. He passed away. His son, his son Jameson, Jamie, was a junior in high school. He was playing on a football team then. That team had no wins. This is 2008. Zero wins. None. And he lost his dad. The next night, he showed up on that team. He was a captain of that team. He believed in the, the, his role as a captain. Wheel of pride. Just like his old man. So think about that. When you think some adversities come into your life, and this sport does it, it does it. It introduces adversity to you. Okay? 16 years old saying, I'm playing tomorrow night. Personal courage, man. Wheel of pride. Wheel of pride. <laughs> Um, that must have been Vaughn. <laughs> um, I've never considered myself a snake in the grass. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's, you got to do what you do. Did I tell you I talked to Don Herman yesterday? Talk a little football, talk outside football. Numbers are coming back for him. 40 players, probably a little bit more than that, because if you listen to Vito, sometimes Don doesn't always tell you the truth. <laughs> he was the only people up this early driving around ahead to the boat. The game's location alternates each year between the islands. A hometown crowd and extra sleep might irreversibly favor the home team elsewhere, but those players miss one of the most electric moments of the Island Cup. It's the epitome of a rallying cry, disembarking at the enemy's shore. Peacock strut and you know they're going off into the the den of the enemy it's an exciting moment it's a big deal you know this is a big great annual tradition and for a lot of these kids the seniors this is it and this is their moment you walk around there's wooden signs on the side of the road with your name and your number on them like you said people are in your house decorate your sleep and you wake up the streamers the bus that brings the Nantucket football players to the school has to go down that road so I know they're seeing all these signs, and the, the total concept behind that is a little intimidating. You know, that they're not only playing a football team, but they're also playing a football community. I'd almost rather win over there than beat them here, because it's, you step into their house, they're cocky, they're gonna win, they're at home, and then to just basically stop them in their tracks on their own field in front of their own families, is just like a, a great feeling. I was always told that there was one year in particular when the venue went to Nantucket to play, that when they came into the gym, there were stuffed scarecrows with vineyard players' numbers on them hanging from the rafters. I remember um, seeing that prank of uh, putting the vineyard jerseys on the graveyard site. It was just a way of getting to, uh, to intimidate uh, the other team. I believe there's always a tradition in the Nantucket game that each team stayed far away from before the game even started. So you may have an injury up until that week and all of a sudden that injury doesn't hurt as bad. It doesn't seem to be as bad because everybody wants to play. But I think, you know, some kids are blinded to how serious the injury is. So that was shoulder number one down. My bone's still like sticking way up. So that was the game I uh, tore the tendon off my bone. So I was in a lot of pain. I knew I had to play in that game. The doctors on Nantucket didn't think it was a good idea, so we actually went off to Boston and we went and talked to some doctors there and we were able to find one who 
could clear me. So me and my mom, we started researching all these braces. That brace came 30 minutes before the game. That just locked my arm so my arm couldn't move at all. Like I said, I threw on a sweatshirt because I know how those games get. If those kids see me with a brace, they're hitting that brace all game, so. You're not in the place where people want you to be. People are screaming terrible things at you. The Whaler flags at the field, at the school, they get me pumped up. We're at the end of the road, fellas. This is it. Don't go out the wrong way. <laughs> You know, Vito was, was always correct when he would say that records don't matter when you play the Allen Cup game. How's the vineyard look this year? Vineyard's gonna be tough, uh, but they're in the same situation we're in, Scott. And you know, records don't mean anything. You know, they've had 260 points scored uh, against them. They were scored like uh, 110, but you, you can't go by that. Throw the records out. I'll tell you right now, it's gonna be a war between us and them. It was a great game to watch. It's back and forth, back and forth. Nantucket kept, every time the vineyard would score, Nantucket would answer. And I had made a bet with the team that had we won the game, I'd, I'd shave my mustache in the locker room afterwards, and there you go. Did he? Well, I'm sure he, I'm sure he looked terrible with or without the mustache. <clears throat> That's going in the movie. <laughs> you could use that. <laughs> so 2004, will forever be known as the Waterboy game. Play of the game was when we kicked off to Nantucket. We tackled the ball carrier. We thought the guy was down. Everybody on our sidelines runs off the field. We see the ball pop up in the air. Everybody runs off the field, with the exception of, of our 10-year-old Waterboy. The, the Waterboy thought the game was over. You know, he didn't do it on purpose. They didn't have the coach push the Waterboy out in front of the guy. When the Vineyard claimed they won that game, that was cheating. And my emotions were, hey, we're going to win the game. Oh, no, we're going to lose the game. Hey, we won the game. All literally within a five seconds. Um, our seniors, I think, went in cocky. Not confident, but went in cocky. And um, Nantucket was able to knock that chip right off their shoulders. So that was an amazing moment in my father's career. He, he finally had some, a little bit of redemption. They carried him off the field, and, and you can see him at the end of the game. He's talking about it. He's crying his eyes out. Little did he know that would be the last time he would win against the Vineyard as he retired, I believe, five years after that. In the 90s, Vineyard became a very competitive team. Nantucket stayed very competitive. You can consider that the golden era. One of the most amazing things that I remember from that game was after we won that game. It was heartbreaking to the Vineyard. The Vineyard coaches showed up here at a party at our house in 90, 1996. And I remember seeing two purple jackets walk up the driveway. I'm like, what the hell are you guys doing here? Are you guys lost? <laughs> no, but they came to the, they came to the party and, and I thought it was a class act. Well, the 1992 Island Cup kind of speaks for itself. You know, the Vineyard had not won on Nantucket in 20 years, since 1972. So we were able to find a way to come back and, and win the game 14 to 12. I mean, we had coaches in the locker room crying. Um, but all of that, one of the most the vivid things I remember was when Dennis Karen, the quarterback for the Nantucket football team, came onto our bus after the game to congratulate us on the team. One of the most classiest moves I've ever seen in the 80s, we dominated the vineyard. In every year up through 84. 1985, we lost that game. We won the game, and Vito walked off the field and didn't bring me the trophy. He sent the trophy over on Monday on the plane. That loss was so bitter, it caused us to go undefeated the next season. To say I forgot the trophy and didn't bring it over, you don't forget that. They were a ragtag group of uh, kids. It was a different island back then, so they were tough, tough, tough kids. I was a junior on that team, and that was a good team. Uh, we went 10-1. and one. Uh, Nantucket dominated the series with the Vineyard, winning about 75% of the games through the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s. The rumor has it that the Nantucket was so successful in the Island Cup in the 60s because they played members from the Coast Guard on their team. Yeah, that's when my father was really young. So he was still, they would test him. He might, he might have to go toe to toe with some of those guys, you know? Players carry all that history with them onto the field during the Island Cup. 
It's all about pride. Right now, you guys are so goddamn up your ass right now because all you care about is the bullshit, bullshit league crap that's going on out there. Get it just out your damn heads. Play the game the way it's supposed to be played. On the damn, how many times have we had 15 yard play in our favor, but no! God damn it, you're giving it back to them because you're doing something stupid. All you're doing, guys, you're handing it to them. They're a good team, but you're not doing a goddamn thing about it. All you're doing is helping them. There's been 60 years of this stuff. It always gets to this. Don't need it. Don't need it. Guy comes to give you a cheap shot, tell him, I'll be right back. Okay? I'll be right back, dude. Okay? Finish with style. Finish with class. You're part of Nantucket football history. Kicking their asses. Yes! Hell yeah! Next time a flag flies, we're all just going to do the old Hulk Hogan. Look at the score. Now show them that we're going to have some fun. Let's have some damn fun. Play some football. Let's go. Hey, let's go. Yeah! That's a man wide open. It's Maurice. The 20, the 15, the 10. No flags. Touchdown! You okay? Find your man. Don't let your man make the tackle. Go. Let's go. The slant. Step inside. If he goes deep, you can get him. And then about five from the 10 yard line. Dude. Oh, what a sneaky little thing that was. All right. Every Watch snap, it. Watch it. he's here and he's leaning forward Coach, and then going. Coach, he's... This guy goes up to Isaac, punched him in the face and goes, what are you going to do, yeah. bitch? Isaac's like, yeah! Like, yeah. <laughs> Wide receiver that can catch here. Oh. 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 When you're a little kid, I remember the days when we would be the ones playing football or whatever up in the field watching the varsity games, and you like dream for games like this. Like football's been my favorite sport since I was two years old because of her. It's her favorite sport too. When the traveling team is the losing team, the mood on the boat is quite different. You know, I see you guys a little upset about stuff, but don't be upset about any of it. But I tell you, from this conversation, every one of you are accountable for next year. In a bitter rivalry, common ground is hard to find, but gathering the pieces of a broken heart on a chilly ferry ride is not unique to either island. You, honestly, I was thinking like this is going to be a sad boat ride back. It's going to be really quiet. It's going to be really like dead. Or no one's going to want to talk. When you lose an Island Cup, uh, it, it takes a little bit of time to digest it all. As, a, as the head coach, I've got to go in and talk to my players and try to make sense out of what just happened. Um, it, it's hard. You know, you don't want to lose to your rival. The, the, the agony of defeat is, is real, you know, and, and it's, it's tough to take. It is an experience that extends beyond football for more than a few vineyarders and Nantucketers. I hadn't had a lot of time to process the passing of my dad at that moment, so um, it was still very fresh. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see him before he passed away. I thought that was a real class move when um, the vineyard wore the VC. To, to symbolize my dad's initials on their football helmet that season. Without further ado, Mr. Don Herman, everyone. Let's give him a big wail of welcome. I envision him looking down on us right now, pipe in his mouth, and tuck a hat on, a glass of wine in one hand, <laughs> clipboard in the other. And of course, we all know what the clipboard was used for. <laughs> and I know that on one week or one day a year, we don't really like each other, okay? 
But it's times like these that when we really find out how much actual love there is for each other. Nantucket, your loss is our loss. Your pain is our pain. May God bless the Capizo and Nantucket family. Rest in peace, my friend. In the winter time when there's a storm and the boat's canceled, there's no food at the stores, everybody's kind of got each other's back. Just makes it, and that gives us a respect for the vineyard too, because we know like, yeah, we hate them and all this, but like they're in the same boat as us. Vineyarders and Nantucketers are a lot alike, right? We don't like each other, but what we don't like about each other is probably what we don't like in ourselves. I don't, I can't speak for people who aren't from a, a community like this, but it's unreal in my opinion. It's, I, I couldn't be more lucky to have played and grown up on Nantucket. Everything that I did in football, I think that has helped me to put me in the position that I'm in in my life, so it was definitely worth it. It's being um, a part of something that's, that's bigger than yourself. You know, I was, I was a part of that uh, experience. I was on the field, I had that uniform on, and it's a sense of pride. I think it's time for the new kids on the block to establish their credentials to establish their or create their own legacies and to continue the great tradition of the Allen Cup. The wager that was most interesting, I think, is that we agreed that whoever lost one year, you would have to wear the opposing team's shirt to a school committee meeting. And sure enough, we lost, and I had to go to the school committee meeting with a vineyard shirt on. I quickly took the shirt off, and I had a whaler's shirt underneath, and I said, but the whaler's shirt is closer to my heart. Most of you don't know this, but uh, back in the 90s, Vito and I actually talked about trying to put our two, our two schools together to form one team. What? <laughs> <laughs> we had done some research, and there was some, actually during this late spring summer, there was an opportunity for our teams from the United States to play over in Europe. And we actually tried to look into putting our two teams together, and the MIA unfortunately said no. But can you imagine? what kind of team that would have been, and how much fun we would have had over there. As a child, you always wanted to play in the pros. You know, that, at, least, at least for me, I always wanted to play professional football. And to, to be able to um, put a uniform on and sit in the locker room and practice, I, I, I couldn't believe I was there. I just, it, was, it, was, it was magical. And I kind of realized that I wouldn't be there that long, just because looking at the athletes and seeing how fast they are, how strong they are, you know, how big and quick they are, you know, I remember exactly what we had to do, and I just relished that. Um, and so when it was time to go, then it was like, oh, that was that was pretty cool. And that gives us a respect for the vineyard, too, because we know, like, yeah, we hate them and all this, but, like, they're in the same boat as us. I'm going to call, I'm going to text him after this and tell him I didn't like the way he sympathized with the vineyard. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy him a purple jersey. <laughs> Oh, he definitely had somebody else on his account, but with the boat's turning. It sound weird? The boat's turning in the sand. In the sand? sand? Justin. Why would the boat be in the sand? Justin, if we were in the sand, we wouldn't be moving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever. You're going to open again. You're going to come back. Yeah, don't leave that. You got to leave that. Don't leave, leave that. that. You got to leave that. That's good. We love that. I don't really, I don't really like the whole, the whole goose poop on the field. I think that if the goose poop was the worst, when you don't have your mouth guard uh, attached to your helmet always, and sometimes it would fall onto the ground during a game, during a scrimmage, or even during practice, and you have to pick that up or a ref will give you a, a foul or coaches will yell at you. It, it's, there's, there's not much you can do about it, but we have like wolves, fake wolves on the field to like deter them, whereas I don't know if they have the fake wolves on the field. Um, probably not because there's so much poop everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it scared me. When, it scared me when I was driving by. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs>
you were right in the middle of the fray. He's already gone. Oh, 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 oh. I had Gary coming right at me, dog. Like, yeah, he's like, he's like, oh, you. Literally, I've never seen you run that quick. I taught my boys to be gentle. Eu ensinei minhas crianças para ser gentil, cavaleiros. To be kind. Para ser gentil. And to be good. E não ser bons. And they do. And they do. <laughs> e eles são. Hey, we're getting this now. This is practice here. <laughs> Afterwards, I, I spent the night at a high-end hotel with Vigo. Interesting. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> so anyway. The next morning, I asked Vigo for directions back to its home. Um, keep in mind, this is long before cell phones, long before Google Maps, and I'd never seen a rotary before. <laughs> so anyway, Vigo gave me directions, and let's just say I almost ran out of gas <laughs> to get back to Woods Hole because the directions he gave me didn't put me in the direction of Woods Hole. In the mid-90s, we, uh, our staffs, would meet at the Bourne Bridge, We had a van, a 12-seater van for the vineyard. And the Nantucket staff and our staff would get up in the van, load the van up, and we'd go to a coaches clinic every year in Newport, Rhode Island. And it was a, it was a fun drive. And uh, there was one time where um, I'm having breakfast with my assistant coaches. And when the bill, time for the bill, I asked the waitress, can I charge this bill to my hotel room? She said, of course you can. So I did. And we left that morning. A couple months later, I ran into Vigo. He goes, hey, Snake, I've got this $90 credit card bill from a, from a Hyannis hotel. What the hell is that all about? I just said, thank you for breakfast.